subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello and another pleasant welcome to your Joy Learning channel. This is SHS Hour with me, Dennis Amoba. And you know, anytime we are here like this, then it means it's time for English. We are here for another exciting moment of learning the English language. We are in SHS 2 and today there's a special topic we have been learning clauses and we shall continue with our learning of the clauses our topic for today is relative clause we have learned the nominal clause we have learned the adverbial clause and today we are going to look at the relative clause which of course is also a dependent clause. If you remember when we learned the clauses, we stated that at the SHS level, we could look at clauses as a group of words with a subject and a finite verb. You remember that. And then we went ahead to establish that when we are talking about clauses, we could also have a main clause or what we call an independent clause and we could also have a subordinate clause or a dependent clause and we said that at the SHS level what we are examined on are the dependent clauses or the subordinate clauses and so we looked at the subordinate clauses and we noticed that the nominal clause was a subordinate clause and the adverbial clause was also a subordinate clause. What that means is that to find the nominal clause, there has to be a subordinate conjunction and also to find the adverbial clause, there has to be a subordinate conjunction. We have learnt all of that and I'm sure you are still watching those videos on YouTube to get a better understanding of what subordinate clauses which are nominal clauses and then adverbial clauses. Today we are going to look at the relative clause which is also a subordinate clause. How do we find them? And as you know anytime we are together like this then of course there are objectives we would like to achieve. So by the end of this interaction we have some objectives to achieve and the first of these objectives is to be able to identify clauses in given sentences. So we will review what a clause is. So we try to identify clauses. We also will try to identify relative clauses in sentences. Okay, once we are able to rem remind ourselves of what a clause is, then we will you know, zero in on relative clauses. What are they? What are their features? We will try to find that. And then we will state the functions of a relative clause or functions of relative clauses in given sentences. When we have found clauses to be relative clauses, what at all do they do in sentences? What are their functions or what roles do they play in sentences and then we will try to use relative clauses in sentences we will try to you know state or write sentences with relative clauses so if you are ready we can begin let's look at this we have said this before what is a clause and as I said in my introduction, a clause is a group of words that has a subject and a predicate, or a subject and a finite verb. When we say predicate, it is a structure that is headed or that is begun with a verb. So when I write, for instance, coffee. 
is reading a book, we will say that our predicate starts from is to the last word, book. And therefore, Kofi is my subject, and then is reading a book is the predicate. Why? Because the predicate starts from the verb. And this verb is can also go to the past. If you remember, we said that a finite verb is that form of the verb which is either present or past. So is is present, it can go to past, therefore is is a finite verb. So when we have a subject and a finite verb, then this whole structure is a clause. That is what we mean by a clause, that it's a group of words which has a subject and a finite verb. So for instance, I can also have this. They are here. Is this a clause? Yes, because are is a verb and it forms a part of the predicate which starts from are and it can be passed, so it's finite. And they, which is a pronoun in place of a noun, is a subject. And this is a predicate. And R is finite. Therefore, the whole group is also a clause. Let's try the third one and see. When I go home, when I go home, maybe I will call you. When I go home, I will call you. How many verses do we have in this? You said it's right. We have go, we have will call. Therefore, these are also clauses. So once we have two verbs, then it means we have two clauses. This is our subject. The I here is our subject. And our predicate is from the go to the last word here. And then our subject again in the second part is I. And the predicate is will call you. And here, go is in the present. So it is finite because we have said that a finite verb is that form of the verb which is either present or past. And we have also said that this, when I go home, is a clause, but it cannot stand on its own because of the subordinate conjunction when. Therefore, that is the subordinate clause, but I will call you is the main clause. You remember that? Good. So we have two clauses. One is when I go home, the other is I will call you. When I go home is a subordinate clause because of the subordinate conjunction when. But I will call you can stand on its own, therefore it is the main clause or the independent clause. These are the things that when we know, we can move on to what we want to learn today. So keep in the back of your mind that we're going to look at structures that have finite verbs and their subject or a verb, which is the head of the predicate and its subject. Anywhere we find that, we should not forget that we have a clause. But if you remember, I said, when I go home, because of when, we will be thinking about time. And any structure that gives us a sense of time, if you remember, we said was an adverb. And since this has a subject 
and the predicate, and therefore it's a clause, then when I go home, it's an adverbial clause. If you remember that, that's it. So we're going to go and then see what we have to do today. Today, what are we looking at? We have said we are looking at a relative clause. How is it structured? So we're going to look at these structures quickly and do the best we can to uh, study them so that when we are taught in class or when we don't even have the right tuition in school, we will still be able to uh, perform should it come as one of the comprehension questions as far as grammatical questions are concerned. So let's look at this quickly. We have this. Says from the structures below, having explained to you what a clause is, we have some structures from the structures below. Identify those that are clauses. So we have first one because of you, because of, you remember, that's it, a preposition because of. And you is a pronoun. There's no verb. Therefore, there's no subject, and this cannot qualify as a clause. Let's look at the next structure. Because you are late, is this a phrase or a clause? Is this a clause? Yes, it is. We have where, which is the past tense of are, and their subject is you. So we have you were. Therefore, this is a clause. Great. And then we have the next one, call me. We have a verb, call. Then, therefore, this is also a clause. Let's look at the next one. Adu knows everything. Adu knows everything. Where's our verb? Great, knows. Therefore, adu is our subject. And once we have that, then it means we have a clause. And thus makes complete sense, as it were. It is complete in itself, therefore, this is a main clause or a simple sentence. You don't need to ask further questions. But the second one, because you were late, we would expect that something is added to make it complete. And because it's not complete, then we say it's a subordinate clause. Why? Because there's a subordinate conjunction because. And when we were doing adverbials, if you remember, this was about reason. Whenever I saw the subordinate conjunction because, means if, if any question were asked, and it had to do with why, then my answer will come from the structure. Great. Then, at the car park, is there a verb? No. At, preposition, the determiner car, another noun, park, another number. In this case, car is sort of describing park, what kind of park. So the window car is a noun, it performs the function of a modifier, okay, of the noun park. So it's performing a function of an adjective. So here we look at it as a modifier, but it is a noun. Then we have, if my teacher sees you, if my teacher sees you, we have our verb sees, my teacher is a subject, Therefore, this is also a clause. So you see that because you were late is a clause, call me, I do know everything, and my teacher, if my teacher sees you, are the clauses. We have four clauses in the structures that were given. I hope you're following me and you have revised. Even if this is your first time, you have understood what a clause is. Don't forget, a clause has a subject and a finite verb. And we say a finite verb is that form of the verb which is either present or past. So for instance, if you have give as the verb, okay, that's the knowledge. What are the other forms of give? We have give, which can come from I give, you give, 
we gave, they gave. Kofi and my mother gave. And then the other form is gives. Okay, gives. Which shows a simple present. Third person. So, she gives. He gives. My brother gives. My teacher gives. Right? And their past form is gave. Okay? These three are the finite form of the verb give. But when I have give, where I remove the E and add ing, this is not finite. We are reminding ourselves, we are revising. So you can go with me. It's important you get your verbs right when it comes to these matters. And then the other form, which is the past participle, is given. These are non-finite. We have done this before, and so when the terms are used, I still have to go back so that you can follow me. And then those that show present or past, give, gives, and gave, are called finite verbs. So when I say finite verbs, all that I am referring to are the forms of the verb which are either present or past present in the first person or second person singular or plural, and then first person plural, which is we, and then third person plural, which is they. So I give, you give, we give, they give, but she gives, he gives, my sister gives, your teacher gives, your friend gives, in the simple present tense. And then the past tense, which has no respect for both the subject and number. So we say, I gave, she gave, my mother gave, they gave, right? Those are the finite forms. And the non-finite forms are the ing forms and the e, and that's the present participle ing and the past participle, the en. Of course, the ing will take the verb, the verb to be. You remember, which are either am or is. Their past form was. Then you can have are. And then where? These are the finite forms of the verb to be. Remember, to be. So we can use them to connect the ing. So if it is I, it is I am given. If it is she, she is given. Kofi is given. Ama is given. I was given money to her. He was giving money to her, and then they are giving, they were giving. You remember that. But to use the given, as in the past participle, you have to have either have, or has, or had, if you remember. So the verb to have will be connected to that. So you say, I have given, he has given, I had given, and then she had given. Don't forget that. So those are not finite. In other words, they cannot be with the subject directly. They can't stand alone. They need what we call the auxiliary verb, which you also call the helping verb. Other times you call it the operator. We have done auxiliary verbs already, and so we're just looking at them in terms of they being finite or non-finite. And we have said that the finite form of a verb is either the present or the past. I am interested because when it comes to clauses at the SHS level, people get confused. So let's keep hammering it. You continue to watch us on this channel and then you watch us on YouTube when you're free so that you get a better sense of what a finite verb is. And at this level, when we say a clause, then before I write a clause, something clause, then I know that there's a verb in it, which is either present or past, and it has its what? 
subject. Good. So having said all of this, all of these, we can now go on to what we want to learn today. So we're going to look at some structures which have verbs. Okay, good. So we go to our first, we still have a clause. Look at the first sentence here. The young girl who answered all the questions correctly is my sister. And a structure has been underlined there. What is that? Who answered all the questions correctly? Can we forget about that structure and read the rest without the underlined structure? So we can say, good, you said that the young girl is my sister. So you see there's a structure which has who that has been uh, that has the blue color and there is a verb answered and the who here is a subject as it were we have we learned conjunctions if you remember this conjunction refers back to the noun it comes after that noun is girl okay therefore this, if you remember, we call it, good, a relative pronoun. It is a pronoun that relates to its noun antecedent. Antecedent. The noun comes and that pronoun refers back to it. We can have two sentences. This young girl is my sister. This young girl answered all the questions, but I don't want to have those sentences separated. So I bring them together and I say, the young girl who answered all the questions is my sister. I bring the two ideas together. So because I don't want to say the young girl answered all the questions, the young girl is my sister, I replace the other young girl who answered all the questions, with who? So that the who refers to girl. I hope that is clear. And that structure which has been underlined has a verb in it. There's one verb here, is, and there's another verb, answered. Right? So it means that we have two clauses, and they should have two subjects to agree. And we say that the subject for both of them is the same, the young girl. The young girl answered all the questions. The young girl is my sister. But we don't want to rep like, repeat them. And as you remember, we said that a pronoun is a word that is used in place of a noun to avoid repeating that noun. So we have put a pronoun here to avoid repeating the young girl again. So that is why we have the young girl. Instead of saying the young girl, the young girl answered all the question, it's my sister. You say the young girl, then the who refers back to the whole thing. The young girl answered all the questions, it's my sister. Let's look at another one. I hope you get this one. I have the exercise books that you bought for me yesterday. We have this subordinate conjunction which refers back to the books here. Therefore, it prevents us from repeating books again. The books you bought for me yesterday, or you bought books for me yesterday. I have the exercise books you bought for me yesterday. Okay, so you avoid repeating books or exercise books, and then you bring that to replace the exercise books you bought for me yesterday. Right, so that is what we are saying. There is a noun behind that relative 
pronoun, which is also called the subordinate conjunction, it refers back to it because it has a relationship with it. That is why we call it a relative pronoun. Could we have had the sentence? How weird would that have been? I have the exercise books, who you bought for me. Could we put this one here? I have the exercise books, who you bought for me or whom you bought for me. You would say, mm, that is not possible. Why? Because the exercise books are not human. That is it. But the first one says the young girl, girl is human. So we could use who for it. So we will come there. That if you remember when we learned the relative pronouns, we said that who, whom were strictly used for human beings. And we could also use that for both humans and things. And we could also use whose for humans and things or animals. You remember that. Who, whom strictly are used to refer back to human beings we have already mentioned. And that which is strictly for things and animals. And then that is used for both humans and things. And whose is also used for both humans and things. Those are relative pronouns. Pronouns that refer us back to nouns already mentioned because we don't want to mention them. We bring them in there so that they can replace them such that we do not have to repeat. We avoid repeating those nouns. Let's look at another sentence. This is the man whose car is missing. So we have a man. This is the man. The man's car is missing. Okay, so I have, this is the man. Then I come and say, the man's car. The man's car is missing. Because I don't want to repeat this, the man, and then the man's, I just use whose to refer back to man. So you say, this is the man whose car is missing. I hope that is clear. Let's look at another sentence. The things that we had to buy were too many. The things that we had to buy were too many. In other words, the things were too many. Okay, the things we had to buy. The things we had to buy. The things were too many. So I put them together in one sentence so that I don't have the things were too many, the things we had to buy. Okay, so you say the things, the that here refers back to things so that it replaces it. In a way, it is saying something about things. I hope that is clear. Good. So what we are trying to say here is that when you have a noun, like the first one, you can have, when you have a noun, you can have When you have a noun, you can have some words describing it, okay? Nouns are described by adjectives. You remember that we said that nouns are described by adjectives or words that say something about nouns are adjectives. So in our first sentence, the young girl who answered all the questions Correctly, it's my sister. So we have a noun here, girl. But before girl, we have some words. We have the, which is a determiner. Young, that is an adjective. It modifies or it describes the noun girl. 
But after Gail, there's a whole structure who answered all the questions correctly. Also saying something about Gail. Okay. If we go to the second one, you also see that we have, I have the exercise books. I could have ended there. But I go to use this whole structure. Exercise here describes books. Okay, and then we have the whole structure that you bought for me yesterday. If you just say, I have the exercise book, somebody might ask the question, which exercise books? And once I ask the question, which, then it means I want some description. And you will see that that you bought for me does that work for us. It does that work. It describes it. And when you have a whole structure like this, which is a clause, because you have said that but is a verb, you is the subject, so the whole of this is a clause. And it is describing books. Then that is also an adjective of a sort. But this is a clause because it's also headed by a relative pronoun. This, that refers back to the books, then we will call it a clause, which is doing the work of an adjective. And because it's headed by a relative pronoun, we call it a relative clause. A relative clause comes after nouns, they qualify. They qualify or, if you want to understand it well, they describe. Relative clauses headed by relative pronouns pronouns that refer to the nouns behind them the noun antecedent say more or they describe the nouns they refer to therefore that is a relative clause and another name because it is describing the noun is an adjectival clause so don't forget what they call relative clauses are what they are because they are headed by relative pronouns that refer to nouns behind them. And because they refer to them and they are doing some description, then we say they are also called adjectival. Adjectival what? Clauses because the structure has a verb and it has a subject. What does it do? It qualifies. The noun, okay, qualifies the noun preceding them or the noun antecedent. So this is a relative clause that you bought for me also qualifies books. So that you bought for me is also a relative clause. The next sentence, whose car is missing, is describing which man? This is the man. Mm -hmm. Who is that man? What kind of man? Is he, there's a, oh, the one whose car is missing. Then I use whose car is missing to qualify the man. And this has is, and that is a verb. And car is a subject. And because it is describing, then it is an adjectival, adjectival, what? Clause, because there's a verb and there's a subject. Or we could also call it a relative, a relative clause. Why? Because it is headed by a relative pronoun and the pronoun refers back to its noun antecedent, the noun preceding it. I hope that is understandable. These are not difficult things. You find your relative pronouns, if any structure is underlined for you in a comprehension passage, and you notice that there's a relative pronoun. Who, whom, ha. You quickly go there and find the noun behind it and say, oh, this one refers to it. And who here, because it refers to the noun behind it, which we call the noun antecedent, then you say it is a relative clause. Why is there a clause? Because there's a verb in it and its subject is the who. 
and then they ask you what is its function then you just simply say it qualifies you know relative clauses or adjectival clauses do qualify or they do qualification so you say it qualifies the noun then you quote the noun great Let's go to the next one. The things that the things that the things that we had to buy were too many. Then we have the that here. So that sort of refers to things and therefore it is also a relative pronoun and once it is a relative pronoun what it means is that it qualifies the noun things or it refers to it so that whole structure that we had to buy is a clause why because we have had and then the infinitive to buy is also part of it and our subject is we then this is our verb. So that's also a clause. And because there's a relative pronoun and the whole structure qualifies, then we could also call it an adjectival clause. It's not e difficult at all. It's easy, right? Let's look at these examples. So we still rem remind ourselves that a clause has a subject and a finite verb. So we are here. We say, Relative or adjectival clauses are introduced. I have said all of that. Are uh, introduced by subordinate conjunctions. And what are they? They are who, whom, whose, that, which. These are the basic ones that we know. There are others like why, which go strictly with reason. So you say the reason why I came here, that why refers back to reason. The reason why I came here was to see you. If I wrote that, then I would say that um, the reason why I came here was to see you. The reason was to see you. But, that, but we have why I came here. Let me write that quickly. The reason sometimes why I came here was to see you. And then I said that you have reason and its structure is why I came here. Essentially, this why refers to reason and that's what it goes with, strictly for reason. And many times some of my students said we couldn't say that, but it is there, okay? You can say the reason why. So why is strictly for reason. And you could have just said the reason was to see you. Why I came here qualifies reason. Okay, the why refers to reason and therefore it qualifies it. And we have a clause there because there's a verb came and the subject I. So it is also a relative clause. What is its function? What is its function? Then you say it qualifies the noun reason. Okay, so these are, and then you have when, the, the time when the game will start is unknown. When is strictly for time. And then the place where the accident occurred has eluded me. Where you have where referring to strictly place or the spot where I lost my money cannot be traced. So spot still place, right? And it is strictly with where. Don't forget that. These are the ones that we usually meet. Who, whom, whose, that, which. And you say who, whom, strictly for human, whose for both human and things, and that for both human and things, and which is strictly used for things. We have these ones. Let's look at this. We also say that the relative or adjective clause describes the preceding noun, okay, the noun coming before that, in a way as to make it different from other nouns of the same class. 
don't forget that the relative or the adjectival clause describes the preceding noun. By preceding noun, we mean the noun antecedent. So the boy who stole my rice, where who refers to boy as a preceding noun. So who stole my rice as the relative clause has been found. So the boy has been found. And then you ask which boy has been found. Then I use who stole my rice to qualify it. I hope that's clear. Good. So let's look at these examples. Here are some examples for us. This is the young lady who won the national prize for scientific invention. The sentence can be found in the syllabus. It is in the Black Star series from two. Don't hesitate to use that book. It's a good book. Black Star series for SHS students. When you go to the school, get it from the bookshop and read it. Make time to look at it. Read from chapter one to wherever. If your teachers are not even there, you have to read that book. It's a good book. And I recommend that all of us as SHS students read it. Book one, you must read. This is in book two. Go find the book two. Black Star Series English, SHS one, good book. So this is the young lady who won the National Prize for Scientific Invention. We could have ended at, this is the young lady. But we see the who here. The, the young lady won the National Prize for Scientific Invention. This is the young lady. So you don't want to repeat the young lady. So use who to refer to the lady. Therefore, this is a relative clause. Okay, because it's headed by a relative pronoun, which relates or refers to the preceding now to make this lady different from all other ladies. Is that clear? So once it refers to it and describes it, we say it qualifies it. It qualifies. Don't forget this. Qualifies. And then you quote the noun. It qualifies the noun. You don't add the young because the young is also modifying it. That's a pre-modifier. This is a post. It qualifies the noun lady. Okay. They put that in quotation marks. Lady. Full stop. That is the function. But the name of who won the National Prize for Scientific Invention is what? A relative clause. Relative. Or if you don't want to forget, you say it's an adjectival because it's describing, right? But here we say it is qualifying. Adjectival clause. Why is it a clause? Because there's a verb. Past tense of when, which is one, and the subject is who. So we have to justify why we are saying it is a clause. It is a clause because there is a verb in it, which is finite, and there is a subject. And that whole clause is doing some description. So it you know, assumes the role of an adjective. And here we say it is an adjective or clause, or a relative clause, because it's headed by a relative pronoun. And then... What's the function? We say it qualifies the noun. Then you quote the noun behind the relative clause. When you are given, go back to the passage and identify it. Great. Then we come to the next one, our next sentence quickly. Have to clean this and then we can deal with it. What's the next sentence? I received the money which you sent me, which refers to money, and therefore it's also a relative clause. It's headed by the relative pronoun which, and we say which is used for things, and money is not a human being. You will not say I received the money who you sent me. Mm. No, you say I received the money which you sent me, and therefore that refers back to this. It qualifies the noun money. What's the name? Relative clause. Great. Why? Because it's headed by a relative pronoun. Why is it a clause? Because there's a verb, there's a subject. Great. Let's look at another. The students who came late were punished. 
What's the basic sentence? Eh? There are two sentences. The students came late. The students were punished. Okay, but if you read it without, the students were punished. And you say, which students? I need a qualification, I need a description. So the who refers to students and the whole clause, because there's a verb came, is qualifying students, so it is a relative clause or an adjective or clause. And what is the function? You say, it qualifies the noun, students, relative clauses, qualify their noun antecedents. Don't forget that word, qualifies. It does qualification. Great. Then we have the woman who repairs computers is here. Without the clause in there, you say the woman is here. And I will say, which woman? Then you use who repairs computers. The woman repairs computers is one sentence. The woman is here is another sentence. But we join them so that one will be used to qualify the woman. The woman does something. So you say the woman who repairs computers is here. And the who refers to woman. Therefore, this is a relative clause. Why is it a clause? Repairs is a verb. It's finite, present, simple, present, third person. And who is our subject? So this is a clause. And it's headed by a relative pronoun. So it's a relative clause. What is the function? Then you say it qualifies the noun woman. I hope that's clear. That's not difficult. Great. Then let's go quickly to some clauses they call defining relative clauses nobody will ask you that but when you are writing you might want to use them because some nouns once you bring them you have to define them so when the relative clause sort of identifies the noun then we say it is defining it for instance you say these are the men and you stop there somebody will ask you which men so we have to define this so our relative clause here, headed by the relative pronoun, will define this. It will still qualify it. So we say, these are the men who want to buy our land. And that who want to buy our land is defining the noun men. That's why they will call them re defining relative clause. When you have them, there are no commas. When it is non-defining, it's not really uh, necessary for us to know what we are talking about, they will be set by commas. So let's look at more examples. What's our relative pronoun? Here are some homes which have been affected by the flood. Where's our relative pronoun? Great, which. And so the clause is which have been affected by the flood. We could have ended at here are some homes. Okay, we can see them, but we want to define the homes. Why? What is it about these homes? Okay, these homes have been affected by the flood. And so this is a relative clause. Why? Because we have, have been affected as our verb phrase. Our subject is which. And this one qualifies the noun homes. So it's a relative clause. I hope that is good. Great. Then we have another. My friend who works at the mall is here with us. My friend. Who works at the mall is here with us. So, my friend works at the mall. My friend is here with us. So, I have my who replacing my friend, my friend. And so, it refers to the noun friend. And who works at the mall, this is another verb which agrees with friend. So, you say that who works at the mall qualifies the noun friend. It's headed by relative pronoun. So it's a relative clause. Or the other name, which is an adjectival clause. It's a clause because there's a verb, works, and our subject is who. Good. Another example. I stayed at home because of the injury which I had sustained during the final march. I stayed at home. I subject stayed, verb, at home. Prepositional phrase, because of, it's another preposition, the ng, that's a noun, which is here. It refers to ng, so it takes its own course. The whole of that. 
So that is the relative clause headed by the relative pronoun which, which qualifies the noun injury. So if you were asked to identify the relative clause, it is which I had sustained during the final march. It's defining the injury. Okay, where did you get the injury? You want to know more about it. So we say that's the defining relative clause. There are no commas. Then we come to non-defining. We, we write the same things. We will bring commas. These are the men. Maybe you know them, so I'll not explain them. These are the men. We have talked about them already, but I put comments to show that I'm not defining them, but you know them. Who want to buy a house? The information is that when the noun is definite, okay, let's say you say Accra, we all know Accra is the capital of Ghana, okay, but you can bring Accra, which is the capital of Ghana, is prone to floods, okay. Everybody knows. So when you bring which is the capital of Ghana, you are not really defining Accra, we know. So you bring commerce there. Right. So when the noun is definite and you bring a relative clause, it will not necessarily be defining, you just be giving us extra information, which we might know already, but we put them there. And then we have here are some homes. Yeah, we know the homes. But you are not really defining it, so you use the, that's why I bring the commas. When you have a comma before the relative clause, it means that relative clause is non-defining, right? And as I said, you have to know that if the noun is definite, we know the noun is like Tetequashi Memorial Hospital, which is at Mampong. We know that that's where it is, okay? It's a busy place on Fridays. So, which is at Mampong, we know. Okay, so then you bring a comma before you bring which is at Mampong. Good. So my friend who works at the mall is here. So we have another comma here. Who works at the mall? Hey, my, I know that your friend works at the mall. So you are not really defined. That's why I bring the commas. But if you don't bring the comma, then you want to define friend. Is that okay? Good. But it's still a relative clause, which you should not forget because it's headed by the relative pronoun, who. We have said that who, whom, are strictly used to refer to human beings and which strictly for things and animals and that is used for both humans and things. Whose is also used for humans and things and animals to show possession. That is clear, I'm sure. Then we have the last one. I stayed at home because of the injury which I had sustained during the final match. You are not really, really defining the injury. That's why I brought the comma here. So with defining relative clauses, it's just in passing at the SHS level, what we will be expected to do is to identify a structure when it's underlined as a clause. But we should be able to tell whether the clause is a relative clause. And if we have found that, we should be able to state what its function is. What is the function of a relative clause? What we have learned is that the relative clause is headed by a relative pronoun many times. But there are times that you will not have the relative pronoun. You have to read between the lines. So that's also there. Don't forget that. So we say that a relative clause is headed by a relative pronoun and the clause qualifies the noun preceding the clause. Don't forget that, qualifies. Great. Let's go to these ones quickly. We always have this. So identify the relative clause in each of the following sentences and state its function. I heard the boys who were outside. Have we seen a relative pronoun? Good. You found that who is here. So we have who were outside. You could have said, I heard the boys. Okay. And so boys is our now antecedent. And then who were outside will qualify. So our relative clause is who were outside because it's headed by the relative pronoun who. There's a verb here, where. So that's a clause, a subject. So it's a clause. And then it qualifies the noun, boys. 
the next one. The pen I bought is missing. The pen I bought is missing. How many verbs do you have there? Bought. What's this subject? I. So look at it. Well, another verb is. What's this subject? The pen. So you notice that there should have been something here. The pen which I bought. But here it is missing. But you should be able to know that there's a clause here. And what is that clause doing? It is qualifying the noun pen. I bought. Okay, it's like the pen that I bought or the pen which, is, which I bought. So here we have a zero relative pronoun. It is not there. But when you look at the structure, you notice that there's a clause that I bought. And that clause says something about the pen. If you say the pen is missing, somebody will ask you, which pen? And they say, oh, the, that's the one I bought. Okay, so I bought there is a clause. It's a relative clause without the relative pronoun. It's an adjectival clause. What does it do? It qualifies the noun pen. So don't forget that there could be relative clauses or adjectival clauses that do not have the relative pronoun to show you that this is it, but you have to read the sentence and look at each part what it is doing there. So here we see that that is not there, but we have I bought and I bought qualifies the noun pen. So I bought is the relative clause because we have I and bought and it says something about pen. Then we have, I think that the food he ate caused the diarrhea. I think the food he ate caused the diarrhea. So I think the food he ate is here. Could have said, I think the food caused the diarrhea. And we are using he ate. There could be something here. The food that he ate, but the that is not there. So this, if it were underlined, you would have to tell us this is the relative clause and it qualifies the noun food. Look at it. Well, the food that he ate caused the diarrhea. The basic sentence, the sentence is, I think the food caused the diarrhea. He ate describes what caused the diarrhea. So it qualifies food. Great. I think that this has been an exciting moment. Let's look at these ones. There are two <coughs> sentences in each. Let's look at how we can use them, a relative or a subordinate conjunction to join these pairs so we can get our sense. A lady spoke to us. The lady is my schoolmate. A lady spoke to us or the lady spoke to us. The lady is my schoolmate. We have to join them using a relative pronoun. My mother bought a book for me. The book has been stolen. Can we join the two? Yes. You have done it. Did you get this? Let's see whether you had this. Did you get this? The lady who spoke to us is my schoolmate. So we have who spoke to us. Becoming a relative what? Clause. Because it has this relative pronoun. And it qualifies the noun lady. So we can use our idea of relative clauses to join two ideas. Without necessarily writing them in simple sentences. You remember we did types of sentences. So this is a complex sentence. There's one main clause and there's an embedded clause which is the relative clause. Okay, let's look at the second one. We have this. My mother bought a book for me. The book has been stolen. So we say, the book which or that my mother bought for me has been stolen. So we have, which or that my mother bought for me. So you could say, the book has been stolen. But you have the which 
or that because book is a thing so you can use both which or that to refer to it great so that's also how we join the two sentences let's try the last one okay the students were late for class the students have been punished the students were late for class the students have been punished how did you write it oh you have said it right so let's look at our answer. Then we have this, I met a gentleman. His mother is your lecturer. Let's get the answer. Are you able to do it? Did you say this? The students who were late for class have been punished. The students were late for class. The students have been punished. So the students who were late. So this is our relative clause. And don't forget, it will qualify its now antecedent. And in this case, it's students. Relative clause because it's headed by the relative pronoun. Great. And don't forget, we say it qualifies the noun, then you quote the noun behind it or preceding it. Good. Then we have Ernest, which is, I met a gentleman. His mother is your lecturer. Then you say, I met a gentleman whose mother is your lecturer. Where's our relative clause? Whose mother is your lecturer? Who's here? That is his mother, right? Whose mother is your lecturer? So the whole structure, whose mother is your lecturer, is a relative clause and it qualifies the noun antecedent gentleman qualifies don't forget i think that it has been exciting coming your way in this edition continue to watch us and continue to watch on youtube this is what we did relative clauses or adjectival clauses they qualify they are now antecedent they are introduced by relative pronouns and sometimes they will not be there but you have to look at the clause that has been underlined and look at its position in the sentence, find out what it is doing, and you'll be able to find it always. I hope it's been exciting, and don't you forget, as I always say, I love you to a bit. Continue watching us here on Joy Learning. My name has been Dennis. I'm over. Bye for now. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.